that I'm a natural uh, curator by heart or a natural collector. And, you know, these things are worth saving and they're worth saving for generations so that our great grandchildren can have touchstones to the history of this music. And so I so appreciate what you do. It's just so meaningful. And I'm so proud that so many things for my family are being cared for in this museum. Thank you, Roseanne. Thank yeah. you. So this, these are my seven or eight tour jackets mm -hmm. from 1980. Mm -hmm. And um, there were several made. This one is mine with my name on it. Uh, this was June Carter's, with June's name on it. And this was my dad's with John on it. My daughters, when Rodney Crowell and I divorced, my daughters got possession of all these jackets. I hate to tell you, but there are more. <laughs> my mom, Vivian, and uh, Rodney's, his own jacket, and his parents, JW and Cosette. These are the ones I managed to pry loose from my daughter's <laughs> clutched hands. <laughs> and it wasn't easy to do. And I gotta tell you that this jacket, my own jacket, was in uh, my daughter Chelsea's possession for years and years. And she actually wore it um, fairly often, I guess. She met her husband when she was wearing it. <laughs> they now have a little baby named Evie, my granddaughter. So um, this jacket has some kind of magic in it. It led to a grandchild, which I could have <laughs> never imagined back then. Um, the other jackets, like I said, I'm working on the other girls, and eventually I hope they all end up here. But I have to thank my daughters, Caitlin and Chelsea and Carrie um, and Hannah, for keeping them safe all these years. Um, and this still fits me, by the way. So. <laughs> um, this guitar. My dad had commissioned for me when I was 24. Is it 1979? It is, right. Yeah, when I was 24 years old. Um, it's a Danny Farrington guitar. He was a master luthier, uh, made guitars for many people. And um, it has a mushroom on it. Why, you might ask. Um, <laughs> As a young girl, I was just obsessed with mushrooms. Not the kind you're thinking, <laughs> but like mushrooms that you, you know, you grilled and ate. I don't know why, I just had a long obsession and he just thought it was hysterical and had Danny put a mushroom into the guitar. And it also has my name across the fretboard here. And um, I just felt like it belonged with you. You know, the, it's in Danny, the book about Danny Farrington's guitars, and it's well documented. If you look at that book, you probably have it here, right? Yeah, it, it talks about the guitar. So, it actually feels um, emotional for me to give these things to you and know that they'll be safe forever. Well, thank you for trusting us with them. We don't take it for granted, and, um, you know, we are a not-for-profit. We don't have an acquisitions budget, so we really do depend on the kindness of people like Roseanne, and these will now be in the public trust to join the other artifacts that you've donated over the years, and we promise to take good care of them, and you know, it's our goal to reserve them forever, and, and it really helps us fulfill our mission here. So, so Rumble strip is. Um, John just said to me backstage, he said, Can you imagine when we met 30 years ago, we'd be going out here to talk about this record label we just started? Um, and we're in well, Can you imagine 30 years ago that we'd be married for 30 years? <laughs> uh, but we're partnering with 30 Tigers to um, do some fun things on Rumble strip, so we're delighted that we get to do that. Yeah, incredible. 
Um, you know, I was thinking, so I've been elected to interview my wife. <laughs> How many husbands out there want that job? Oh yeah, honey, I'm happy to interview you. <laughs> um, you know, I was thinking about backstage, uh, you know, I'm a city boy, I grew up in New York City, and uh, I was thinking about the night I met Roseanne, which still is vivid in my memory, where uh, I had, I came, uh, I had written all these songs with Jim Lauderdale, you all know who Jim mm -hmm. Lauderdale is? So Jim and I had written all these songs uh, in my little uh, one-bedroom apartment in the East Village in New York, and they were, in our minds, country songs. <laughs> um, and by some miracle, Rodney Crowd heard it and expressed interest in helping Jim get a deal and, and basically invited both of us down to meet. And I met Roseanne. Now, if you were to have told me that night I would have gone on and produced a record for her two years later and then 30 years later still be married to her in the Country Music Hall of Fame talking about the record we produced. I just would have thought, well, you're speaking Arabic. You're sorry. I mean, I wouldn't have had any idea what they were talking I just couldn't have imagined it. So this is nothing short of a little miracle to me that we're here tonight. It's a miracle to me, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, because in many ways, it's like your life before we started working together is still, I still like, wow, it's like, I mean, it's almost like another universe for me, you know? Yeah, I, I feel at home in both universes, I have to say. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know. But I'm intrigued by the universe before we met because it's the part I truly don't know about, you know? Well, um, I mean, I had a, I did have a life here and um, I've lived in New York now for 31, 32 years, but I feel such um, a piece of home here and a piece of my heart. And um, this physical facility is so important to me. But the community here and the people I know and love and the fact that I made a lot of hit records here, you know, and I, I was... Why would you want to work with me with all those hit records? <laughs> oh, I, it's, a, it's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'd like to talk about because oh, God. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, no, it's still a bit of a mystery to me. I mean, you, from the outside, you had what seemed like, well, I mean, we didn't know each other, and I was in New York, kind of following a different path, although I always really loved country music. And you seemed like you had such an extraordinary career. It was it seemed like artistically uh, satisfying and commercially satisfying, and you're putting out record after record and they all seem to do well and you were sort of living what on the surface like you were living the dream. So what possessed you to risk all that mm -hmm. and make a record with me? That's well, the... there was a transition record which was my album called Interiors. So, mm -hmm. oh, everyone who bought it is here today. <laughs> record that either ended or started at all. <laughs> so I had made King's Record Shop and it was enormously successful and I had some leverage with the record label and I said, I want a lot of money and I want to produce the next record myself. And just to be honest. And um, so I was granted both and they didn't like the record. It was a very dark acoustic record. My marriage with Rodney Crowell was falling apart. I was unhappy. I didn't like being famous. Um, I felt somewhat like a fraud in some way. I was so, good at what I did, though? but so, I wanted to go deeper. So all this time, where you're basically having really well-received records, you felt like a fraud. This I felt like, I mean, because my um, self-image was first and foremost as a songwriter, and I wasn't writing any more than half of the records. I was going to ask you about yeah, that. I, I went back. Like, I know you don't believe this. You um, went back and looked at my I went back records before we all, came out here? Yeah, because I knew I was going to interview you. <laughs> <laughs> and I realized there were some serious deficits. Because <laughs> uh, you know, I'm pretty self-centered. All I cared about was our life together. Um, I went back and I looked, and I'm looking at all the songs, and I'm going, wow, she didn't, she didn't really write that many of them. They were great. Like, you can't write a better song than Seven Year Egg. Mm -hmm. They were great. Um, but I am noticing, like, God, there's an awful lot of covers here. Yeah. And um, 
And then I notice on interiors, like, well, this is the first record where you wrote all the, the whole time. album. Yeah. Yeah. So, to, yeah, explain the well, sort of the, the journey to get to that place of, of interior. Well, I did have a little bit of imposter syndrome. I was very successful with we all. covers. Well, we all do, yes. And um, so I wanted to make this dark acoustic record that was about a very dark, difficult time in my life. I made it, I was really proud of it, produced it, wrote the whole album, and it wasn't commercial, and the label let me know that right off the bat. And um, I was really depressed and didn't know what to do, and then I called my dad and asked for advice, which I didn't do nearly enough. I wish there were so many things I could ask him now. I think that's a common regret. And he said, oh, to hell with them, you know, move to New York. <laughs> and I went into the label and I said, this is going to get worse for both of us. You're going to have to let me go. And they did. And so then that led to me, I had met you. Um, I was hypnotized by you. And not just um, artistically. <laughs> and I. Okay, I'm. Um, <laughs> play this song. No. No. And um, I wrote. I went to see Leo Kotke in a club in New York, and I wrote lyrics to this song on a napkin. I know that sounds like a trope, but I actually did. And I thought this is a way, good way to get next to John Leventhal. I said, Do you want to write the music to these lyrics? And he did. And I had written um, several songs by then for a next album that I didn't know what it would be. And I found that they were full of these instincts for transformation. They were full of urgency and they were full of all of these violent nature metaphors. So I said to him, I have these songs and they're very elemental. Do you want to produce an album? And he goes, are they good songs? Is it like elemental? What are you talking about? And um, so we then co-wrote a few more, and we made the wheel. And on our record label Rumble Strip, the first release is the 30th anniversary reissue of the wheel. Marks 30 years together, 30 years of record making. Um, do you have the picture of all of these albums we made together in 30 years? It might be up there. Are you, what are you playing? Oh, there are. I don't know, I'm just kneeling because I just knew it. The wheel, tin song demo, rules of travel, black Cadillac, the list. What comes after the list? The red of the thread. The thread. Mm -hmm. And she remembers everything. Now, the list was nominated for an Americana album of the year, if I correctly, but didn't win. No, Jeff. we won. Did we win? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my memory, I didn't win. Where's Jeff? <laughs> we won, right? Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but we got a revenge because the next record, The River and Thread, won three Grammys. So that was, <laughs> that was good. Um, well, okay. So, you know what's interesting is, so, uh, from my perspective, you, you know, so that was your journey. Mm -hmm. My journey was, I was a clueless <laughs> musician. <laughs> And I had literally, I had, it was a, nothing short of a small miracle to me that I had started to make my living as a guitar player in the early 80s in New York City. You know, from my perspective, no small feat. And I had no, I never thought about being a record producer. Oh, it really never crossed my mind. Although I was always the guy in any band that I was in was like, hey, bass player, what if you played it like this? Or I was always the guy who had an opinion about it. <laughs> and um, by some small miracle, I had developed these two co-writing partnerships, one with this one with my name is Sean Colvin and the other one with Jim Lauderdale. And that led to me producing both their debut albums. Um, um, Sean's record did pretty well, but Jim's record was a complete failure. <laughs> and all of a sudden, this incredible artist, asked me to produce her next record, and she had had massive hits and a huge career, and I'm just thinking like, I hope I don't fuck this up. <laughs> that was the only thing I was thinking. And I really didn't know, I was 
concerned about my ability to deliver at that point, like dare I say, a commercial, a hit record, because the industry was very much geared to the hits back then. Um, so I went in probably with a fair amount of trepidation. I, I can't imagine you had an incredible amount of confidence in my, uh, like. I did, you know, because I loved what you had done with Sean Colvin, and, and I thought your instincts were amazing. And then you said, let's co-produce it. I think you were that was smart. That was <laughs> insurance. <laughs> So we should play it. It's called Tears Falling Down. Yeah. I can. I wrote it on piano, but I'm praying I can figure out how to play it on guitar. Oh, there's photos of us in the studio. I know. <laughs> and Roger Mudno, right? Well, I was going to get to that. Roger Mudno, I believe, is here. Are you here? <laughs> we haven't seen much. <laughs> This right, and there's a whole, uh, which is amazing, he did a great job, and uh, engineers like Roger inspired me to become an engineer, so that's a whole other conversation, but here we go. I actually look like I know what I'm doing behind that console, which I didn't. <laughs> It's a ghost of a dream that awakens me in the night when no one's around. But I don't hear the sounds of those tears falling down. It's a breath of a kiss and so much tenderness that drives my knees to But we don't hear the sound of those tears falling down. There's a river that won't forget, and a wind that takes our breath in the cradle of our fears. We sleep without. Shows me where love can be found, but we don't hear the sound of those tears falling down. Those 